welcome to Berea Temple International Church's podcast. I am your host, Timothy, and we're here together on this beautiful day to hear from God. Today, we're fortunate to have our beloved pastor, Mike Gonzalez, with us, who will be sharing God's word. So let's all prepare ourselves to receive what God has in store for us today. Let's begin. Well, again, good morning, Bereans. And to our guests, we want to say welcome home. We pray that you will find this place inviting, welcoming, that you will find the people friendly, not uh, standing off, but very friendly and probably the most friendly group of folks that we've ever had the opportunity to worship with. And so we are thankful and grateful that you chose to join us together, join with us today in worship. So if you're aware, for, for our guests, I want to give you a little bit of setup for our regulars. We already know this year we are in a series called I Am. And we have been looking at the I Am statements that the Father made in the Old Testament. I am Jehovah. I am uh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, uh, Jehovah Ra'a. And, and looking at who God is and then seeing who we are in light of who God is. We moved from that, we moved into the I am statements of Jesus, connecting him to the Father and showing who he is and who we are in light of who Jesus is. But as we've said before, anything that the Father wants to do, the enemy wants to imitate or to counterfeit because he wants to try to pull us away from anything genuine so that we attach to those things that are fake, so that we get our feelings touched, we get our emotions uh, tickled, and then we're no longer capable of rightly discerning what we have gone through. And so as we journey now, we've undertaken in our series we're calling I Am Sin. Uh, we've gone through the I Am statements of compromise. We've wrestled with the snares of temptation. We've dared to uncover the shadows of secrets, all because we are keenly aware of what John chapter 10, verse 10 tells us says that the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. That is our foundational verse that we have connected each week to our statements, I am sin. This is the lie of the enemy. This is his uh, I am statement. And as we gather kind of one more time on this series, we're going to close it out with this one. We're going to confront the, embo the embodiment of darkness itself. I am sin, death. The enemy, the enemy wants nothing more than what did our passage say? To destroy us. celebrate diversity. Man, woman, black, white, young, old, rich, poor, I don't care. I seek all equally. I devour all wholly. It doesn't matter who you are. I am going to kill you. I am sin. Because ultimately this is a force that knows no bounds. No distinctions and no preferences. It knocks on every heart's door regardless of age, race, or station in life. It, in its pursuit, it seeks to claim all, leaving no soul, no individual untouched. So this is, again... A heady, a heavy topic, and I, I understand that we're digging kind of deep into some things today, but I promise we'll come back out on the other side. Because I can tell you that there's hope. There's redemption. And ultimately, there's a way out of the darkness that so many of us feel is pressing in. There's so many of us that feel like there is just this shadow that overhangs us, and there is a way out of it. Because we have to look 
at the universal reach of sin. We look at what it can do to us and we have to unlock a truth that has power to transform our lives. Because again, the enemy wants to imitate. It wants to fake, to counterfeit. How might we say that? It wants to lie to us. And the only way to counteract a lie is with the truth. The only way to open up what is real is to be truthful about it, to open up and to speak truth that leads us to a Savior who conquered sin and death and is ultimately offering us eternal life if we will only accept it. The problem is many of us are handed the gift and we set it down and go, it's for later. Not today, I still have stuff to do. I'm going to set the gift down. I'll come back to it one day. And for some of us, it never happens. And so we're going to kind of take a journey today and we're going to remember that we don't walk alone in this journey, in this, this journey to truth back towards our gift. The Spirit of the living God walks with us, empowering us to overcome the grip of sin. So here's where we're going to go today. We're going to look at the all-encompassing reach of sin. We're going to unearth the truth that speaks to every, to the very heart of our humanity. And through the grace of our Lord, we're going to find liberation from the lethal grasp of sin. For each one of us, we need to hold on to the life that transcends the shadow of spiritual death. This is my prayer for us. Why did I do a series on sin? Again, it is not to give light or credit or homage to the enemy, but that we are aware. We don't find ourselves caught unaware of what the enemy is trying to do in our life. And the reality is, and again, students, this is a part that would be important to you. The enemy doesn't want you to see adulthood. The enemy doesn't want you to reach fulfillment in Christ because he knows that if he can get you to stop, if he can stunt your growth, if he can stop you from reaching the ultimate fulfillment in Christ as an adult, then he doesn't have you as a mouthpiece to go out into a lost and dying world. And so if he can silence your mouth now, then he can silence your mouth on into adulthood. So here's what I want us to do. We're going we're gonna to look at a few things. The first thing we're going to look at, if you're a note taker, this is number one, the inclusivity of sin. Romans 3.23 should be a passage familiar to most of us. If you can't quote it by memory, it's on the screen. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standard. You may have learned it differently, because as again, I memorized these passages when I was a kid in the King James. But I'm presenting it to you today in the New Living translation. Sin knows no bounds, and this truth knows no exception. Sin knows nothing. Sin, like a relentless tide, sweeps over the entirety of humanity, paying no deed to age, race, or status. It doesn't matter where you are in your life in this room. I could step down off the platform and walk and talk to each one of you individually. And guess what? Every one of you is a sinner. Every one of us. Oh, pastor, stepping on toes. Pull your toes up. But it is the truth. It knows no race, it pays no heed, it pays no honor. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account, it doesn't matter how empty your bank account is. The enemy is trying to pull you in. See, the enemy is a master, he's a master manipulator, he's a master storyteller, he's a master liar. And he knows how to infiltrate our lives, weaving threads into the very fabric of our being. There are times that we don't even realize that he has dropped a seed of doubt. What was the original sin in the Garden of Eden? Doubt. 
God didn't really say, don't do this, did he? And he began, we talked last week, about the sin of compromise and how the sin, of, or, or the sin of temptation and then the sin of temptation led to the sin of compromise, the eating of the apple, which ultimately led to the sin of secret. They hid from God. And we don't realize that the enemy has dropped just the ever so little thread of weaving sin and doubt into our everyday lives because he is a master at it. Look for a minute or think for a moment at the compromises that we've made, our own personal bouts of weakness, those things that we yielded to in temptation, both good and bad. There is good temptation, there is bad temptation. Every one of us, as I mentioned that, can think back. There's the biggest one that sits on your heart. And if I said, think back to a moment of weakness, you immediately went there in your mind. And you're praying, dear God, please don't let that ever come out. These aren't isolated incidents. These are just echoes of a universal struggle. I am a sinner saved by grace. If you have ever struggled with alcoholism, with narcotics, with any kind of life controlling problem, and you are familiar with what's called the 12 step program, uh, more commonly associated with Alcoholics Anonymous, NA or AA, uh, NA is Narcotics Anonymous. If you're familiar with that, one of the first things that they do when they sit down in the room is they go around and introduce each other and they say, My name is Mike and I'm an alcoholic. It's been X number of years since I've had a drink. And it doesn't matter the number that's inserted. It could be six weeks, 10 years, or 40 years. They still identify as an alcoholic. Sin wants to pull us into that lie. Sin is an echo of that struggle of who we are and wants to remind us of what we're doing. But all we have to do is apply the truth of God's word to who it is. And as a new believer, we are no longer that old thing, right? We are a new person. We confront the reality that sin is no respecter of persons and we allow it to come into our life and say, look, I am a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. I'm no longer that once was. I am who he says I am. Because here's the thing. Sin likes to allure us. Sin likes to tempt us, if we're keeping up with our, our pattern of, of terminology over the last couple of weeks. Sin often wears a mask of allure, of, of drawing in, of, of wanting to be sensual, not in a sexual way, but something that is tempting, that, that is, is enticing. And it promises us with fleeting pleasure and false fulfillment. It disguises itself in the garments of desire, leading us down treacherous paths that lead to compromise. That apple doesn't look so bad, does it? It's just an apple. It's just a piece of fruit on a tree. God didn't really say don't eat it, did he? And she pulled an ache. See, it whispers secrets just like that. And those secrets that we talked about last week, they're, they're, they once were harbored deep down. And we think nobody knows where they are. Nobody knows the details. And they sit and they fester. They get infected. Forgive the graphicness of that illustration. But they fester until it has to come out. Until there's no longer a place under the skin or deep down in the spirit. It has to come out like a wound that's been left unattended. Yet even in the face of this inclusivity, if you will, this inclusivity of sin and death, we, 
We don't stand condemned by the Father. What do we stand with? With an invitation to freedom. He gives us an opportunity to come to Him. Just like sin knows no bounds. It knows no race, creed, color, background, pocketbook. Neither does the grace of my Lord. It doesn't see class. It doesn't see color. He doesn't see race. He doesn't see ethnicity. He doesn't see pocketbooks. He doesn't see status in the socioeconomic climb. It is through him that we find strength to face the unyielding consequences of sin and be able to emerge on the other side of it victorious. It is him who guides and leads and orders our steps. And if we have given our heart and our life to him, then death no longer abounds inside of us, but life has the opportunity to come if we will only accept him. If we will only allow that truth to come out. Remember our passage from a few weeks ago. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. But if we what? Confess our sins to him. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. What is the word confess? It is also could be say if we speak truth. Then sin no longer can abound. Sin no longer has any authority. All we need to do is to bring that sin like we talked about last week into the light and this grace and mercy that God offers can abound. So what is there that needs to come out into the light? What's going on in your heart? What's going on in your spirit that needs to come out? It needs to be shown the light of day. So that truth will prevail. And death will no longer have a hold on you. Death will no longer be the end result. Will no longer be your inheritance. If you're a note taker, number two. There is a lethal grip that sin takes and places on our life. When we talk about I am sin, death, sin is lethal. And we need to accept this truth. We look, need to look no further than Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. End of story. Sermon over. Go home. However, The free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. There is a second half. The wages of sin, yes, are death. But thank the Lord, praise the Lord, we have an opportunity to have a free gift. Remember, we're on a journey back to this gift that is through Jesus. And it is eternal life. These words resonate with a gravity that we cannot overstate. They unveil the stark reality that sin, sin always has a toll. Sin always has a price. And here's the thing. If I were to get on Highway 44 and drive down through Springfield on my way to Tulsa, There is a gate on the freeway that I have to stop at and I have to drop cash into. And if I want to stay on 44 and go the quickest, cleanest, fastest route, I have to pay for that. But there are other ways around. It's just going to take you a lot farther. It's not going to be as as nice. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to be slow. It's going to be difficult. It might in some places be more treacherous. But there is a way around it. Sin doesn't offer that. Sin always exacts a toll. There's always a price to pay. And it always pops up at the least place that you would expect it. 
And at the end of the day, there is none of us who can bear without consequence. Sin is universal to every one of us. Sin's like a debt collector. You ever have one of those called? Don't raise your hand because I don't want to know. When we were young and dumb, we had an incident where we had missed a, a bill, didn't realize it. Our phone rings. Hi, this is so-and-so from whatever debt collection services. We're calling to collect on blah, blah, blah. I think it was a hospital bill. I think it was from when the first kid was born. I don't know what you're talking about. Goodbye. Click. 20 minutes later. And truly, I, I didn't at that moment. I didn't. I thought it was a scam call. I let it go. Didn't think anything of it. 20, 30 minutes later, phone rings. Pick it up. This is so-and-so, a different person from such-and-such such collection agency. And I think we did that for about three days until finally I was like, I'm going to have to call and figure out what this is. And we call the hospital. Uh-oh. $550 or something like that. You know, one of those little fees that one of the other services bill you for separately that you didn't know about. But if you've ever had to deal with these people, they are relentless. They will call during dinner, during breakfast. They will call you at work. They will call you at home. They will find the hotel that you're at on vacation and they will call you and bug you while you're poolside. But that's sin. It is persistent and it is unrelenting. It doesn't matter if sin abounds here or if you go on vacation, sin is going to abound. It doesn't matter if you're in a good place or a bad place, sin is going to be persistent and unrelenting and press in on you, even at the most difficult times. It seeks recompense for our transgressions, leaving us shackled to the fate we cannot escape on our own. What are the wages of sin? Spiritual death. This body's going to die regardless. Short of my Jesus coming and taking me away into the sky, this body is going to waste away one day and, and be done. But the spirit man, if I continue to live in sin, will ultimately die and be separated from Christ for forever. We'll be separated from the glory of God for all eternity. But here's where Christianity, Jesus, this is where it all meets, rubber meets the road. This is where the brilliance of our faith shines through. For beyond the wages of sin, what does God say that he has? He has a gift that is freely given by our gracious Father. Through Jesus, we find not only liberation from the lethal grip of sin, but an invitation to eternal life. So how's that? How do we do it? Look at John chapter 1 and verse 12. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. It doesn't say that to all who knocked on 50 doors a day, it doesn't say for all who will uh, say this prayer at this time and this place and do what, all these lists of tasks, it says whoever believes and accepts. I believe that he is the father, the son of the living God, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, and one day he is coming back for me. And I accept him as my Lord and Savior. I no longer live. Mike Gonzalez no longer exists, but Christ live within me. That is my hope for glory. Amen? And I hope that that is your hope today. So I want us to hold on to a truth. The power of sin is great. but the power of our risen Lord is greater still. I want to dispel a myth 
an urban legend. I'm not asking this question, but I want you to answer it in your mind. If I say that God is God, what is the antithesis of God? Many people would say the devil, right? There is a a teaching in Eastern uh, theology, Eastern religion, that, that believes in what's called yin and yang. There is good and there is bad. If there is an equal good, there is an equal bad. And many of us in our minds, whether we believe it or not, whether we accept it or not, many of us, when we picture it, we have God and we have Satan. And we see them as opposites of each other. But how can a a, a creator and a, a created being be equals? They cannot. Satan is a created being by God. Thus, he is no not equal to God. And so no matter how great the sin that abounds in your life, no matter how difficult things are in your heart, no matter the relationship that is broken, the sin that has had trapped in your life for all of your existence, whether whatever it may be, there is no sin that is too difficult for the Creator to overcome. There is no problem that He cannot provide an answer for. And so whatever is going on in your life, whatever sin is abounding in your life, the truth of the gospel is all that is necessary to overcome because God is greater still. Through Jesus, we are offered not just freedom from sin's clutches, but a promise that life transcends the grave. Listen, like I said, One day this body is going to pass. One day I'm going to be worm food. And there's going to be a day that my grandkids or my great grandkids kind of forget about me. And the existence of Mike Gonzalez will pass into non existence. And that's okay. Because I don't live for recognition here. I don't live for a a life filled with stuff, temporal things here. I live a life here so that I live with him for eternity there. When I stand before him, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. So now we're going to move into the meat of the message. Those were all points, but they're really just a a really big introduction. If you're a note taker, this is number three. How do we resist the voice of sin and draw near to the source of our strength? How do we find victory in our Lord and Savior? So number three is resisting the voice of sin. I want us to look at James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. James gives us a call to action, if you will. James gives us kind of a, a, a map on how we can resist this voice. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Those words are not just a suggestion, but a divine directive. What are we called to do? We're called to resist. Think about that power that has, we have within our grasp. When we submit ourselves to the Almighty, when we stand firm against the schemes of the enemy, the devil must flee. The darkness that once seemed insurmountable now scatters before the light of our God. Resist. That seems to be a popular word in our society today. Regardless of your political affiliation, resist. Fight back. Push back. 
There's an awful lot of people fighting and pushing and resisting in our world today. And then it seems like they walk into the church or they walk in, they they have their spiritual life and it's just like, oh, whatever. And the enemy presses in. They're like, well, what do we do? We resist. We push back against the darkness that presses in. And then all of a sudden, that darkness that seems so insurmountable, there's no way I'm going to overcome this. There's no way this relationship is ever going to be fixed. There's no way I'm ever going to overcome this addiction. And then you expose the addiction to the light of the truth of the gospel. And all of a sudden, something that you couldn't do on your own now becomes completely manageable and overcomable in the light of Jesus and his grace and mercy. Doesn't mean that it's over today, but it means that you are on a journey to overcome it. For some of us, when we came to Christ, he took the addiction away immediately. That's not most of us. Most of us find ourselves on a journey. Nicotine is a horrible addiction. Those who have overcome smoking know that. Addiction to drugs is life-altering. Addiction to alcohol changes who you are. Changes your, your, your mindset. So how do we do it? We draw near to God. But this isn't just an act of devotion. This isn't just, Lord, let me pray, let me, let me read my Bible more, because it is a source of our strength and our victory. It is a connection back to the thing that renews us day by day. Each one of us needs to be renewed daily. And might I ask you, A very difficult question. I don't want hands. I just want you to introspect, inner inner reflect on this question. For many of us, we have been believers for years. Might I say decades. And in those early days, we had our Bibles out. And we had our highlighters, and we had our markers, and we had things written in the margins, and we were reading, and we were studying, because we couldn't get enough of, of the Holy Spirit. We couldn't get enough of God's Word, and we were hungry, and we needed to be satisfied day by day. And then there came a day where, where the busyness of life, the enemy says, God didn't really say read your Bible every day, did he? Well... I've been a believer for 12 years. I've read through the Bible. I know what it says. It's okay, I'll, 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 I'll get back to it tomorrow. I'm not going to do my reading today. I'll get back to it. I'll get back in the habit next week, right? Because next week I've got vacation time coming. I'm going to be off and I'm not going to have any pressures. And next week turned into next month and next month turned into next year. And occasionally we pick up our Bible and we might play a little, I call it Bible bingo, probably Bible roulette's a little better. And we we flip open our Bible and we, okay, this is my verse for today. But there's no sitting at the table of the Lord and consuming the meat of God's word. And if truth be told, and again, no hands, Truth be told, we haven't cracked our Bible at all this week. Students, the word crack just simply means breaking the spine of a physical book. I know most of us don't do that anymore. We're, we're scrolling or what, tapping or whatever. So for the students, we haven't tapped on our Bible app this week. We haven't allowed God's word to daily renew us, to daily refresh us 
to pull in what it is that He wants to speak to us today. This is drawing near to the Lord. How do we resist the sin that presses in every day to every one of us, me to the back of the room? We draw near to the Lord through reading, taking in scriptures, taking in prayer. When we draw draw near, God reciprocates. He draws near to us with love and power that transcends all of human understanding. Do we see this anywhere in scripture? Look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. What does the passage say? It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice, who? Jesus. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. I will pursue. I will come a part of the way. I will come in and I will share a meal to get, and we will share a meal together as friends. What does this verse tell us? If we will do our part, if we will come a portion of the way, he will come the other portion, and he will close that gap, and friendship, uni- unity, fellowship will happen. Listen, this has been a hard message. It's been a hard series. Nobody likes to talk about sin because when we talk about sin, it begins to shine flashlights, searchlights into the deepest, darkest parts of our heart. But we've got to deal with the issues that are there. If we as individuals want to move forward in our growth, in our maturity, in, our, in, in who we are in Christ... We need to know we're not powerless against the enemy's attacks. What does it say for the shield of faith to do? To stave off the fiery arrows of the enemy. Listen, if you haven't been able to tell, the passages we use today are what is called the Romans Road or a modified Romans Road. It's to present each one of us with the reality of our sin. Every one of us has sinned. Every one of us has fallen short. But And the wages of that sin, that that is death. But all we have to do is call on Him. Confess our sin. Believe and accept Him as Lord and Savior. And He will come in and He will share a meal with us. And have unity and have fellowship. Because he is the one that gives us life and power over death. So today I want to close this chapter on our series, The I Am Sin. I want to extend an invitation, a divine call, if you will. It's an invitation to choose life. It's an invitation to choose life over death. To step out of the shadow of compromise. To step out of temptation. To shine a light on the secrets. And step into that radiant light of God's truth and redemption. Let's pray. Father, as we stand at the crux of this moment, we come before you with hearts that are full of gratitude and reverence. We thank you, Lord, for the revelation of truth that has illuminated our hearts. We thank you for your boundless grace that extends to each and every one of us, regardless of our past, regardless of our struggles, regardless of our own failings. Father, in this moment of reflection, we surrender our burdens to you. We lay down our compromises. We lay down our temptations. We shine a light on the secrets that we have placed at your feet, Lord. Father, we acknowledge a need for you in our lives. We acknowledge a desperate dependence 
on your mercy. A need for your grace. And we ask for forgiveness and cleansing power to wash over us. Lord, we invite you into the depths of our hearts. Come and dwell within us and be the guiding light on our journey. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Some of you may be finding yourselves at a crossroad. And if the voice of sin has grown deafening in your ears, know this, you do not walk this path alone. Our gracious God walks beside you, ready to lead, to guide, and to empower you. And if you have yet to experience the transform transformative power of God, the change that Christ can make in you when you give your heart and life to Him. If you long for freedom that can only be offered by Jesus, today is your day. In just a moment, as our worship team leads us in our final closing song, if that's you today, I want to invite you to come and to pray. If you want to pray with someone, we'll have some prayer folks up front. We would love to pray with you. If you would love to pray alone, go to the altar, kneel, pray, stand, whatever you want to do. Whatever you need to do to make things right with God. But we would love to give you some next steps. We would love to invite you to take a step forward, to surrender your burdens, your secrets, your compromises. Come and embrace the gift of eternal life that awaits you through Christ Jesus. And might I dare say, come and draw near to God so that he can draw near to you. So as we sing, Father, I pray for those that need to come forward. May their spirit be prompted and may they receive the encouragement and strength to take a step forward today in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Berea Temple International Church Podcast. We hope that you've been blessed and inspired by today's message. To stay connected with our church community, download our BTIC app from your phone's app store or follow and subscribe to our podcast wherever you're listening. We would love to hear your thoughts or questions on today's topic. So please feel free to share them with us in the comments or by sending us a message through the app. If you found today's episode helpful, please consider sharing it with a friend, a team member, or in social media. Your support helps us reach even more with these inspiring messages. As we close out today's episode, let us remember to keep working in the Lord's finding until Christ comes, Maranatha. And as always, don't forget to tune in next time for another inspiring message. See you soon.